Okay, so seeing as it's uh, 10.01, we'll get started. I'm sure people will continue to trickle in here. That's okay. Uh, so firstly, just a few points of housekeeping. You'll notice that your mics and videos are turned off entering today's meeting. Um, that's in, in order to facilitate a smooth session. Uh, we'll ask that you keep them that way and submit any questions that you might have through the chat box. Um, today's meeting is being recorded, so and it will be made available after the session via SVCA's website and also through the YouTube channel. Uh, next slide, please, Britt. So we're gonna make a few small tweaks to today's agenda, including moving all questions to the end of the session, just to, to ensure that we get the best flow out of this. Uh, but to be sure there will be ample time at the end of the session to open it up for questions via both the chat and via the video functions um, as well. Just have an open forum discussion if people want to hang on for a bit. So with that being said, um, I'm going to now turn things over to our general manager, secretary, treasurer, Jennifer Stevens for some opening remarks. Good morning, Hi. everyone. Uh, Join please. the meeting. Good morning, everyone. Please allow me to introduce myself. Uh, as Sean has indicated, my name is Jennifer Stevens, and I joined Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority in June of this year as the new General Manager, Secretary Treasurer. Today, it is our intent to review the Authority's programs and services related to the protection of life and property from natural hazards such as flooding and erosion processes. You will be introduced to a number of authority staff who lead these programs and services. It is our intent that you will walk away from today's session with an understanding of how you might make use of the authority's expertise in making informed decisions related to emergency response planning. Next slide, please. The story of conservation authorities begins in the rural watersheds of Ontario, where deforestation from agricultural land uses led to erosion, allowing runoff and flooding, as well as drought. Conservation organizations came together to address the environmental conditions at the time, and the result was the Conservation Authorities Act, which was passed in 1946 with a mandate to conserve, restore, or develop, re develop natural resources of the watershed. After the most famous hurricane in Canadian history, Hurricane Hazel, the Conservation Authorities Act was amended to include powers to control waters to prevent floods or pollution. Next slide, please. The key to conservation authorities being able to do our work is the watershed focus, transcending municipal boundaries and potentially different opinions. When decisions are being made and data interpreted by Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority, it is with the premise that everyone lives downstream. We see the big picture. Next slide, please. On this last slide, before the more detailed presentations, I want to provide you with an overview of the authority. Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority has 15 member municipalities representing the watersheds of the Saugeen, Pine, Penetangotor rivers, as well as smaller lake fringe watersheds along Lake Huron. From its source in the Osprey wetland conservation lands, the Saugeen River generally flows northwest about 160 kilometers before exiting into Lake Huron in Southampton's. The authority has jurisdiction over 4,675 square kilometers and owns over 8,498 hectares of natural areas consisting of significant natural areas, forests and conservation areas. With this introduction, I now pass the floor over to Sean Anthony to talk about our flood forecasting and warning program. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. 
So uh, I am the flood warning and water quality coordinator at Saugeen, and I'm going to be telling you, like Jen mentioned there, flood, uh, all about our flood forecasting warning program. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so Jen did a great job giving an overview of our, um, of our Saugeen conservation in our lands. So I'm going to skip over this slide. And I'll just note here that, uh, go back, Britt. I just note here that we are divided into 10 major sub watersheds. Okay, next slide. So while flooding can occur anywhere there is development in close proximity to uh, water or low lying areas, SVCA has four primary flood damage centers, including Durham, Newstad, Walkerton, and Paisley. So many of these communities were developed near the river due to the need for water power to drive mills and float timber in times past. While these needs of the communities have changed over the years, the residents and businesses remain, and we as regulatory officials must do everything we can to mitigate flood impacts. Next slide. SVCA's overall flood management program encompasses both non-structural approaches designed to keep people away from water and structural approaches which are designed to keep water away from people. For my presentation, I'll be focusing on the flood forecasting and warning, which allows us to warn residents in the floodplains to reduce risk to life and property. Furthermore, I'll delve into the emergency planning aspects, which allow us to integrate flood warning with emergency response plans. Next slide. So it's important to remember that no two floods are exactly the same, as you'll see in this table of recent events. Lately, we've started to observe floods uh, throughout the year where historically, and except on very rare occasions, floods happen during the spring freshet. Of course, this makes forecasting a complex effort as so many different factors must be considered at all times of the year. In years where Great Lakes ice formation is delayed, floods can be caused by a deep melting snowpack resulting in a pure volume sort of flow. They may be caused by debris jamming and dams and other water control structures, which causes the water to flow around the normal sluiceways. When we have a particularly cold winter, it's likely that ice jams will develop during break uh, during breakup, which can cause the flood waters to move out of the regular channel. Or as experienced in 2017, when 150 millimeters of rain occurred between June 23rd and 24th, convective storms associated with climate change now pose a new difficult to predict sort of threat necessitating faster response times. Next slide. So in order to communicate the onset of a flood event and to continually improve response times, we have a flood warning program at Saugeen Conservation. The purpose of the program is to relay routine information concerning watershed river conditions to selected agencies and municipal officials, and to provide rapid advanced warning and technical support to concerned officials and citizens whose lives and properties may be endangered by flood waters. In terms of guidance, we, all, we fall back on two main documents. Internally, we produce and update a flood contingency plan which is circulated every year. In terms of external guidance, we rely on the Ontario Flood Forecasting and Warning Manual produced by the Provincial Flood Forecasting and Warning Committee, which is a multi-agency group composed of reps from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, uh, CAs, uh, Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks, Environment and Climate Change Canada. Next slide, please. So the backbone of the flood warning program at SVCA are the 21 stream gauges located throughout the watershed. Generally speaking, these structures are composed of a stilling well, which is embedded in the river bank and connected to the stream by an intake pipe. A sensor within the well records hourly changes in water level. This data is then accessible remotely via telemetry software, which pulls each of the gauges automatically and populates our internal database. As you can see in the map, we have good spatial coverage across each of the major watersheds in SVCA's jurisdiction. Next slide, please. So just for everyone's reference, uh, driving around the watershed, you might've noticed one of these uh, structures, usually close to a bridge. And these are just the housings for our flood warning equipment. 
And in the bottom right hand corner there, you'll see um, an example of a data logger, which is housed within the structures. And it's these units that collect the data and communicate remotely with our flood warning database. Next slide, please. So in addition to the flood forecasting role that our stream gauges provide, they're also critical for maintaining a long-term record of flows. Here you can see the, the flow record for the BD Saugeen upstream of Hanover from 1984 to present. We get many data requests every year from municipalities, engineering consultants, academics, and various other groups interested in this flow data. And for a multiple, multi, multitude of reasons, uh, including mo modeling, research projects, recreational purposes like kayaking and fishing, and floodplain delineations. Next slide, please. So another critical piece of infrastructure related to flood forecasting is our network of rain gauges. Similarly, they're pulled hourly and provide forecasters with a snapshot of rain accumulations, which in turn are used to estimate our runoff vol volumes. Most are simple tipping bucket style gauges, which essentially count the number of tips, which is then converted to a volume. We're also able to predict runoff volumes by conducting snow surveys. Currently, we operate 14 snow courses throughout our jurisdiction on a bi-weekly basis between November and May. Each of these sites, at each of these sites, we take 10 depth measurements at set locations, which are then weighed in order to determine the snow water equivalent, which is essentially the relative water content, content within the snowpack. And this is presented in millimeters of runoff potential. So this is really handy, for example, if you have a snow water equivalent of roughly 50 millimeters and are expecting a full reduction or melt of the snowpack with a 25 millimeter rain on top of that, you could then fairly accurately estimate a 75 millimeter runoff. And this is crucial for dec deciding where our messages should be targeted and to what severity. Next slide, please. Through our partnership with the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, we're also able to tap into many other products as well. So here are some examples of the bi-weekly snow maps produced by the province. Shows, some of them show snow depths, snow water equivalents, and percent of normal. Next slide. On this side, slide, you can see that we have access to forecast, uh, wave forecasts lake levels, and surge predictions. The flooding section of the Ontario webpage also contains a flood message map to see where other messages have been issued and the content of those messages. Next slide. Other products also include flood criteria maps, which tell us the relative amount of rain or snow melt that would be required within a 24 hour period to produce flash floods. Next slide. And finally, through the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry, we have access to their Whiskey Web Pro portal, which contains data from all of the stream gauges and rain gauges um, associated with the network across the province. Next slide. So the next couple of slides might be of interest to anyone who is involved in declaring or preparing for a significant weather event. <clears throat> There's some amazing free stuff out there, such as remote sensing data products from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association, such as Great Lakes ice cover products, uh, which are released daily, uh, remotely sensed snow water equivalent data, again, updated daily, and surface water temperatures for each of the Great Lakes. Next slide. So historically, we have done some weather forecasting in-house using a network of wind and evaporation sensors. However, with so much open data available these days, we really just rely on external but very accurate sources of information. Some of the applications that I find particularly useful include Windy for checking wind speed and direction forecasts, but also for setting precipitation alarms, as you can see here. Meteo Blue, Environment Canada radar products, and the Wonder Map produced by Weather Underground, 
which is really handy for visualizing rain accumulations. Next slide. So at this point, you've heard about the many tools that we're using at, um, at SVCA to prepare flood forecasts. And we're now gonna pivot to more of the procedural aspects that are probably of greater interest to our municipal county and emergency service partners. So on this slide, you can see the general hierarchy within SVCA for how flood forecasts are prepared and communicated to municipalities. Conservation authorities are empowered through the province historically by MNRF, and now, although not yet updated on this slide, uh, through the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. By default, CAOs and general managers of conservation authorities are the legislated flood coordinators for their respective organizations. Within SVCA, we have a flood warning and water quality coordinator, yours truly, who oversees the operations of the Flood Forecast Center and several other duty officers. In addition, we have a number of staff who act as river watchers and several staff who ensure our water control structures are operated in such a way that they mitigate to the best of their abilities, the effects of high water. Next slide, please. So this diagram just shows the flow of information and decision-making pathways. It starts with collecting data from a number of sources. This is a routine process, which may be aided by the use of automated flow and weather alarms. Our, data off our duty officers then compile all of this information, at least daily, and formulate, formulate a flood forecast. If necessary, a flood warning, and war flood warning coordinator then directs the activities of the river watch personnel and receives field verifications. The flood warning coordinator also directs actions of our dam operators, specifically in West Gray, who may be required to pull boards from dams in order to accommodate flood waters. The flood warning coordinator also prepares and issues official flood messages through the fan out system. Next slide. Looking here at the fan out system in more detail, you see that notices are always posted to the SBCA website, and though not noted here, but also to our social media channels. Through the fan out system, the messages will be delivered to municipal and provincial police municipal and county designates, different arms of government, the media, and other individuals and organizations as required. It is, then, it is then the municipality's responsibility to provide direct warning or evacuation to dwellings and businesses in the floodplain. Next slide. So all CAs across the province use a standardized color-coded messaging system to relay information about floods. A watershed condition statement is issued when general watershed conditions suggest high runoff potential that could lead to flooding. And to remind the public that rivers, streams, and ponds may be unsafe for recreational or other activities. A flood watch is issued when the potential for generalized flooding exists throughout the watershed or it's identified in specific municipalities. A flood warning is issued when flooding is occurring or about to occur and typically applies to a specific area of the watershed. I'll also note that a new standardized message for shoreline conditions was developed amongst CAs in 2020, as high lake levels continue to pose a flood hazard. The definition for a shoreline condition statement is an early notice of the potential for flooding on the Great Lakes based on weather and lake conditions. As this is new or at least rare territory with respect to lake levels, our staff continue to work out criteria that would warrant the issuance of such a message. This may be something that our shoreline communities will come to recognize in the future. Next slide, please. So when we issue a watershed condition statement, it is emailed directly to our municipal flood coordinators, including CEMCs, and our neighboring CAs. When we issue either a flood watch or a flood warning, it is emailed to all members of the fan out system previously described, and it will also require uh, confirmation of receipt of the message. Next slide. Upon receipt of a flood watch or a flood warning message, municipal officials should, number one, 
enact their own municipal fan out system to warn municipal officials, affected citizens, businesses, and the general public in the floodplain. They should also coordinate a flood watch patrol and municipal emergency flood response. Finally, they should assess the flood situations and liaise with SVCA flood coordinators. Next slide. So in order to ensure an effective and timely flood response, municipal officials should be thinking about integrating SVCA's flood warning procedures into their own municipal response plan. In order to help summarize this, I've made this diagram with recommendations for how this can be accomplished. As we move from normal conditions to a watershed conditions statement, municipal flood coordinators should enact their own fan out system to pass along the SVCA flood messages. So we move from a watershed condition statement to a flood watch, municipal flood coordinators should make preparations to initiate the emergency response plan as it relates to flooding. So this might include identifying floodplain residents and businesses that need to be warned, identifying transportation to be effect, affected, and identifying expected critical, critical infrastructure affected. As we move from a flood watch to a flood warning, municipalities should initiate their emergency response plans with respect to flooding. This might include declaration of an emergency, evacuation of residents, closure of roads, streets, and bridges, and critical infrastructure shutdown. Next slide, please. Before I wrap things up, I wanted to point out some of the new endeavors that we are working towards at Sogeen. So in the new, near future, we're going to have um, an option for email signups for flood messages posted on our website. Uh, we'll also be sending out an emergency test message, which will require uh, re confirmation of receipt from our municipal and county officials and other organizations that are identified in our contingency plan. Thirdly, we'll be adding several more remote webcams to our current network for field verifications. In terms of just over the high horizon or down the road, we'll be adding real-time hydrometric data to, our, to the SVCA website and expanding our network of rain ga gauges to enhance our response times. And in a perfect world, we'll achieve flood zone inundation mapping for all of our flood damage centers. Next slide. And finally, I'll quickly speak to what is in the forecast so far for this winter. It is a La Nina year, which means we'll see fairly variable weather, which increases the potential for a midwinter thaw. The Great Lakes will likely remain open or ice free for an extended period, uh, which will increase the potential for lake effect snow. And after this week, we'll start to see a slightly below seasonal start to the winter. Next slide, please. So with that, Thank you all for your attention and tuning in. And I'm gonna pass things over to Joanne Harbinson, our Manager of Water Resources and Stewardship Services, who's going to speak to SVCA's flood control infrastructure. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you, Sean, for that lead up and Jennifer for the lead up on in today, today's sessions. So I am the Manager of Water Resources and Stewardship Services. So we know that to have healthy people and healthy watersheds and a healthy economy, we need to have a good supply of good quality of water. However, when we do have too much water, we have flooding and issues arise. Where there is not enough water, there is drought conditions and issues arise. It takes a coordination of efforts with a number of SVCA staff that pull together the work related to the flood control structures. After they are built, we need to make sure that they, the integrity of these structures remains effective for their built purpose. Municipal staff are integrated in this process and certain with the major work that may be required. So in our watershed so far, and obviously there hasn't been any new structures being built, but we have at least 19 uh, flood and erosion control structures, and we're speaking to the water control structures today. 
The structures have been constructed across the watershed at a cost of $13.5 million that protect 1,120 buildings, homes, and businesses, and about 4,500 people. Next slide, please. So in our watershed, this is the list of the flood control projects that have been completed for the, be for the benefit of the protection of life, property, and to reduce soil explosion disruption. All of these projects were supported with provincial funding up to 85% and 15% from the local municipal dollars. Depending on the project, in some cases, lands were purchased for projects or easements entered into with landowners. Work on the various projects crosses throughout the years with input and management of experienced Saudi staff. Field operations and myself conduct frequent inspections on the projects annually, monthly, and following severe weather events to determine if there is any deficiencies or repairs required to the structure. In addition to the annual maintenance, uh, SBCA field operations coordinate minor repairs. Maintenance includes grass cutting to ensure that trees and shrub growth is reduced so as not to compromise the project. Clean out of outfall channels and making sure flat leaves are functioning and not blocked. Staff monitor and operate the dams for changes in flows, debris, ice, or obstruction. Next slide, please. In the town of Durham, there are three dams and a small section of dike in the upper uh, part of the dam, upper dam, as well as an ice management channel at the lower section of the river. I will go over these projects in a bit more detail. Because of the historical frequency and almost annual <clears throat> issues with fragile ice in Durham, extensive amount of time is spent monitoring the river system and the structures to ensure that river flow is not obstructed and that it stays in the channel and does not flood property or the residents of Durham. Next slide, please. Like many dams, the Upper Durham Dam is a century old dam with five main bays. This structure has the 245 meter dike that is along the south side of the dam to ensure that the Saugeen River waters are directed through the dam structure and prevent from waters from flowing into the residential area. Over the years, there has been a number of challenges with the management of the structure and its role in flood protection and mitigation. This dam is also integral to the campground, providing swimming opportunities, but management through the summer is needed as well as a result of runoff events. SVCA field operations completed some concrete charging of the dam this, this past year, led by Rick Robotham. In the next few slides, I'll also show you how the winter freeze-thaw cycle raises havoc with the concrete at this structure, and in particular at the upstream side of the dam piers. During high flows, events, and ice-free conditions, the river water can leave the channel and flow to the north side of the dam and overflow into the bush. During these winter during winter and typically associated with a rain or snow on um, rain on snow or snow melt in January or February or the spring freshet, water has been known to also go over the south side of the dam, but typically returns to the river just downstream as there is a dry channel you know, before the old school crossing that intercepts the water and returns it to the side. Here. Next slide. Next slide, please. Winter time is a different scenario for flood management. As a result of frazzle flooding over a number of years, it was recommended in a report completed in 2006 by Hatch and Associates, the dam to be configured with boards uh, placed in a certain number per bay so as to increase or speed up the freezing over the reservoir surface and, and river upstream of the dam. The river is used for frazzle storage and having ice covering the channel that extends upstream, this will reduce the production of frazzle between the dam and the concession too. You can see in the photos, there are uprights in the south three bays with flashboards to hold back water and ice. The north two bays also have timbers in them to encourage freeze up with the main flow being pushed to the north, to the north bay. As Sean has explained in his presentation, the changing temper, temperatures are closely monitored over the winter. The typical January thaw is critical to know how the ice level upstream will change. And to determine come February, when the boards and timbers can be removed prior to spring thaw. In the winter, a snow dam is also built by the municipal staff in the lower parking lot at the dam as a safeguard to ensure that if waters come over the dam and bay on the south side, that they again will be.
Okay, it looks like we're having some technical difficulties with uh, Joanne's video there. Britt, do you mind switching down to um, Eric's presentation? Eric, if you don't mind just um, starting and then we'll, uh, we'll head back to Joanne if she gets her video up and running again. Sounds good, Sean. I'll just wait until uh, Britt gets us down to mine. Okay, great. Um, so yeah, I'll be uh, speaking to you today about the Environmental Planning and Regulations uh, Department at Sogging Valley Conservation Authority alongside uh, Brandy Walter, who will present the, the more specific planning comment side. I'll focus on more of the regulatory side. Uh, next slide, please. So I try to bring a little bit of levity to, to my presentations as, as typically it's a pretty serious subject matter. Um, and uh, as you can see here, yeah, everybody is interested to get as close to uh, the natural hazards as possible as they are typically beautiful natural areas. And um, they come with their risks as this, uh, this uh, cartoon reasonably captures, but it is in, in effect and indeed no laughing matter. Next slide, please. As we've already heard from Jen, um, much of the uh, authorities and many authorities regulations uh, are and, and have come from tragedy, unfortunately, with uh, Hurricane Hazel being the sort of watershed moment for Southern Ontario and Ontario. That did bring about um, a significant loss of life at that time. Um, I think 81 people were lost in that flood event that uh, actually did have a, a local um, uh, impact uh, with regards to uh, the, the upper piece of text here describing that there were uh, there was a train conductor and engineer that were lost um, from heading from Palmerston to Southampton uh, when the rail line was washed out and there was a derailment during that hazel event. Um, but the lower clip is uh, with regards to a first responder that um, that uh, was a fire, uh, fire fireman at the time uh, of Hurricane Hazel, thinking back to it uh, 30 years later, it looks like and where they're quoted as, as indicating and is a motivating factor to me and my department that uh, the incredible roar, roar of water like the roar of Niagara Falls, it was a gigantic flood with, with smashed houses and uprooted trees bobbing like corks. Everything going down the river so fast, houses crashing into the sides of other houses, people everywhere screaming, and then you couldn't hear the screams anymore. So that's a pretty heavy uh, moment uh, in our history and one that that has motivated uh, a different in a, approach to new development, which is um, the planning and regulation section in Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority's uh, focus. And as we heard from Sean, sort of a non-structural uh, management approach and methodology to to address and to avoid that sort of a tragedy from happening again. Next slide, please. So initially, what are some of the impacts of, of flooding on, on residences, on buildings? I'll, I'll, I'll run through some of those. So here we have a, an unfortunate looking bathtub ring up around the eye level of this individual on the family photo on the wall. Uh, that is an indication the water came in and left. And it, of course, left behind a fair amount of damage, uh, both structural and potentially and or uh, contamination, because often floodwaters are not uh, too clean, given they pick up a lot more um, material from areas around uh, rivers and, and water courses, but also you can often get those combined sewer sort of interactions in, in urban centers. Next slide, please. Uh, there are, of course, the more uh, uh, classic flood impacts that they literally just knocks your building or your foundation right out of the way and takes with it a lot of flood flows. This is obviously a, a local photo uh, from Scone area when we had a, a large flood there, and I think it was 08 or 09, a uh, huge sort of yeah, convective uh, storm event that, that just dumped a lot of water in a small area, and it targeted this, this dam property quite specifically. Next slide, please. There's other more benign impacts, though, of flooding. Uh, here's a Hanover uh, Park, you know, a, a reasonable place that, uh, that, that is a good place for flooding to occur. But it sort of highlights another concern that you might run into, certainly as municipal staff or first responders with roads or considering uh, rescuing anybody from a, a property that might have already been developed and doesn't necessarily have safe access in a flood condition. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Same area and uh, obviously a flood condition. 
And okay, you, you know well enough where the laneway is if, if you're familiar with the property as a landowner or a, you know, a local um, you know, first responder maybe that you've been to this property before, you know the laneway's on the left side of the rocks. Uh, all well enough, I can probably maybe get in there with my equipment. I have a big enough four by four to, to get into the house that's maybe on the other side of this, this flood area. Uh, but there's hidden risks. Next slide, please. Sometimes you can't see the damage that's happening underneath the water level. Even though you may have assumed that the road's still there, um, it, it may not be, given that the water and the floodwaters can sometimes hide you know, significant or, or minor uh, harm. This is not very significant erosion. Many of us can probably recall, I think around, around uh, 2005, there was a, a convective storm that hit Toronto and Finch uh, Avenue was blown out in the process. A uh, you know, 100-foot chasm, or at least a, a 50-foot chasm anyway, in the road where, where there was pavement up until that uh, hours before that rain event got there. Next slide, please. Obviously, with, with significant implications if you were to try to use that type of a laneway. And next slide, please. With regards to structures themselves, though, even if they they uh, are you know can, can, uh, not in necessarily a high erosive area whereby the water just sort of ponds up around them, you'd think to wade in wouldn't be a big problem. To to, to be in that dwelling wouldn't be a big problem, even though the water would obviously be a nuisance. Um, you can have a lot of pressures uh, and forces still applicable to those foundations. We've seen in our jurisdiction historic developments get moved off their foundation in flood flows. Uh, not necessarily because there was a high velocity there, but because of the nature of the flood flows and the and the forces that that can and are applicable uh, in some instances. So here's some description of some of those. So you have uh, buoyancy pressures and 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 forces that can try to almost erupt a, a foundation from within, if not outright popping a foundation right out of the ground. If you were successful at having a um, a flood proof foundation, for instance, whereby the water can't get in, you in essence create a boat. And if it doesn't crush in from the sides or from uh, below, it can actually try to act like a boat and pop out of the ground and float downstream and not obviously the idea. So there's a number of different forces, not just, you know, the, the typical um, nuisance of the water coming in that can affect uh, any given structure and is certainly notable for, for, for those of us, of us trying to design around these issues. Or, um, or folks trying to go in and save people in these scenarios. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So now we come to, to, to my purpose here and that in, in my purpose in this challenge of, of flooding and in the Salgeen's uh, challenge in this flooding situation of, of how do we and how can we guide new development anyway? We can't necessarily protect existing development, but how can we uh, guide new development to not uh, repeat the same mistakes and not put new people in harm's way, um, you know, or or the people that might have to go in and rescue them, such as some of the folks on the line here today. Uh, so we have a, a plan input and review component of our work, which Brandy will speak to just after me, uh, talking about, you know, where should new subdivisions go? Where should new lots go? Uh, where should um, appropriate municipal zoning uh, go in, in, in accordance with provincial and the natural hazard policies? Uh, she'll talk to that. I'll talk about now though, the regulation, uh, the, um, <coughs> excuse me, the development interference with wetlands, alterations to shorelines and watercourses regulation, which some of you may be introduced to already, but I'll, 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 uh, I'll uh, get into those details here now, whereby we are actually regulating and permitting or not uh, works in certain areas, private, public lands, doesn't matter, uh, so that they are directed away from or address these flood uh, hazards. And then we also have other things we review, such as municipal drains, environmental assessments, that also are playing into this larger uh, new development question around flooding. Next slide, please. Uh, so we, we have uh, direction from the province of, of what level of a flood we are to protect to. Uh, there's a range. You could protect to the one-year event. You could protect to the thousand-year event. Somewhere in the middle is probably the appropriate uh, flood event that we ought to protect to, to allow development to happen, to not be over restrictive, but still be restrictive enough that we don't have a tragedy occur should a major flood event arrive here again. Um, so what we are tasked with in, in, the, in our jurisdiction anyway, is using the Hurricane Hazel flood event standard as our regulatory storm event, being the event that we protect any new development to and regulate in and around. Uh, but we also are aware of the 100-year event in certain areas because uh, the 100-year flood event, for instance, at the mouth of the Saugeen River, 
in our jurisdiction is actually larger than the, um, the Hurricane Hazel flood event. Another caveat to that would be though is, uh, for instance, in Durham uh, in 97, the, the frazzle ice flood flows actually went larger than Hazel to, to, <laughs> to the, uh, the objection of everybody involved, of course. And uh, we actually are and, and do have to use those known levels of flooding in our jurisdiction to regulate too, uh, so that, yeah, we're not putting people in a known flood area. And we have an engineered floodplain map in front of us that in indicates where those flood extents go to, which we use in our work and also recommend, as Brandy will describe later, to municipalities with regards to their, their planning documents. Next slide, please. Where we don't have engineered floodplain mapping, we have aerial photo interpretation of with the best information available of where those flooding areas are anticipated. And we use these in, in the rural areas for the most part. We have the engineered floodplain mapping in the urban centers. Um, and these are our hazard land maps. And we, we have ground truth them for the most part. And fortunately, we have digitized them <laughs> almost, well, entirely at this point. So we aren't using these old maps so much anymore. Of course, using modern GIS information to, to uh, update, um, review, and change where necessary when, when new information comes available. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so then around this information of where we know flooding to be occurring, uh, we, we are tasked with, uh, with the administration of, of the Conservation Authorities Act being the, in, our, in, in, in that context, the regulation, which is the development interference of wetlands, alterations to the shorelines and watercourses regulation, being regulation Ontario Regulation 16906 as amended. Uh, a bit of a mouthful, uh, which I'll, I'll get into the definition of what it's specifically interested in works in a moment here, but its main goal is to protect, protect against the loss of life and property, uh, damage and social disruption from flood and erosion purposes, uh, processes I should say. Uh, and in, in doing that, in serving that new development and those uh, people that are trying to and are, are building in or near uh, flood prone areas or natural hazard areas um, to protect them we end up protecting and conserving local ecosystems because in essence we we are we have to protect the wetlands and the headwater areas if we're going to protect people from fl flooding upstream or downstream of those features of course <clears throat> next slide please So the features or the, the landforms that are regulated by this regulation are hazardous lands, which includes flood flooding areas, rivers or stream valleys, shoreline of Lake Huron, watercourses, wetlands and areas of interference next to wetlands, and then a buffer around all those features. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and this is a, a sort of the more modern uh, take on, on uh, information that we're using on a daily basis and is indeed available to the public or municipalities uh, with regards to the areas that our regulation uh, are, is likely applicable to or, or may be applicable to. Um, we, we've updated actually this interface on our website just recently. Uh, so it's a, a lot more user friendly than, than any of you that are familiar with this format in front of you. Uh, but it does indicate of <clears throat> the approximate screening area and approximate regulated areas that if you wanna know where the SVCA have inter has interest with regards to our regulation, you go to our website or the county websites and they'll outline exactly this type of information whereby in town uh, we have uh, the, the yellow uh, sort of shading which is uh, just a nuance of, of our process it is an area that uh, we have engineered floodplain mapping for so that's quite a specific you know shaded area it shouldn't be varied too much with on the ground review in the end um, by, by SVCA staff but then the orange is our approximate screening area whereby if you are in those areas we come out and review whatever you want to do uh, we'd refine in where our actual regulatory interest is and uh, proceed on that basis. Next slide, please. So while the, the development uh, interference with wetlands alterations to shorelines and watercourses regulation has some of its own um, description of its own interest within the title, uh, development is, is sort of not well defined there and actually is in the case of Conservation Authorities Act a different de definition of development than say in the Planning Act, which is notable because it is the construction, reconstruction, erection or placing of a building or structure of any kind, any change to a building or structure that ha would have the effect of altering the, or the, the use or potential use of the building or structure, increasing the size of the building or structure, increasing the number of dwelling units in the building or structure, 
or site grading or the temporary or permanent placing of or dumping of or removal, removal of material of any kind from the site or elsewhere. So that's certainly a different development. But then uh, the interference with wetlands within the title obviously indicates we have an interference with wetlands interest, uh, alteration to water courses and shorelines, other components of our regulation, of course. Next slide, please. So what works then, if, if we know what, what areas we're interested in, what landforms we're interested in, uh, what are we interested in uh, actually happening uh, to build off the last slide? So that means any new buildings or structures or changes of use or intensification of those uses of those buildings may be permitted activities and likely would be. Uh, water course cleanouts, straightening, uh, docks on, on small inland lakes, uh, new crossings or water course enclosures would of course have a regulatory interest. Any of those things could impact flooding uh, on that property or elsewhere. We have interest in laneway works, uh, drainage works, roadway works, so of course interest to this group, and any sort of filling or grading or other site alterations because yeah when you have that basin of the floodplain and you start filling that basin with whatever material that can change where that floodplain goes obviously to, uh, to the potential detriment of others. And of course infrastructure works can have a major implication. Next slide please. <clears throat> So once we establish that you're in a regulated area and you're doing work that is regulated, well, well, well what am I measured against with regards to getting a permit? So the, the tests of the regulation is that if the control of flooding, erosion, dynamic beaches or pollution or the conservation of land may be affected by the development, then uh, if it's a negative impact, that is potentially a permit that SVCA staff and or the authority may not be in a position to issue. Um, but that means though, even if you're in the regulated area, it isn't necessarily a no-go area. If you're in the floodplain, you know, infrastructure has to go in there. Roads have to go in there still. Uh, you can still get a permit for those works. It is just then getting the right design together, uh, the right information in place. So we know we don't negatively impact anybody um, without mitigating. Um, if there is, of course, a disagreement on, on, you know, an applicant doesn't think that they, they haven't addressed the test of the regulation, they can appeal, appeal that. And there isn't certainly an appeal uh, process whereby uh, they can either go to a hearing with, uh, with our authority, uh, our executive committee. And if they don't like the results of that hearing, they can continue up the chain to different appeals. And as of um, the news yesterday, that process might be changing a little bit from, from the provincial government. Uh, but in, in, in effect, much of that is still the status quo, but but who you go and appeal to might be be changing as, as things move uh, literally as of yesterday. Um, we have not thus far, and when we have it, had any matter be appealed above the uh, Section Twenty Eight Hearing Committee, we have not lost or, or been unsuccessful at in a in a appeal at the Saugeen, which is one certainly notable item, uh, but also very notable, I think, is that given that we are responsible for every permit we issue and whether if, if we issue a permit and then that item gets flooded or does damage to somebody else, those folks can and, and would have the grounds to come and have some serious questions for the Sahagin on, on why that permit was issued. And uh, we've never been sued and not been sued on any type of matter like that, which is also telling we are, we're doing it right with all successful appeals and, and not uh, permitting too much that uh, then comes back to, to harm anybody. Next slide, please. Just like with any regulation, of course, there has to be an enforcement component. Um, so associated with our regulation, if you are convicted of a violation, uh, the fine would be up to $10,000. Uh, notable is we don't get that money back at the Saugeen, even if we are the one that, that foot the bill for the prosecution. Um, it goes to the MNRF. Um, there is the potential to be if you are convicted in prison for a term up to three months. I've never heard of anybody actually having that subjected to them in the province, but it is a, a tool available. Um, it, it, I would assume it'd be, you know, if, if somebody dammed up the river, you know, downstream of Walkerton and it flooded an entire community with, with significant implications, that might be reached for. Uh, but we, we fortunately haven't seen that and nobody else in the province has. Uh, but the real kicker is uh, if you are convicted, the court may order the removal or rehabilitation of the property to pre-development conditions. You know, I've dealt with a number of uh, wind turbine projects, for instance, and when I, in when I indicate that the fine is $10,000, they nearly have the check written for me before uh, I can even finish the sentence because that would allow them to proceed with their project without any review. Uh, but, but then I get down to line three there and they start listening again. <clears throat> um, 
Also of note, we have not been unsuccessful in a prosecution to date, and our regulation has been in place in some way, shape, or form uh, since the 70s, of course, updated most recently in 2006. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the highlights of the regulation, of course, is that we protect those wetlands and headwater areas, um, which, which retains that flood storage and protects downstream communities, which also uh, maintains the boundaries of those floodplains downstream. If we're uh, very intensely reviewing a project or a land uh, landowner's proposal next to the floodplain on their small property in Hanover, um, you know, they want to know exactly how close they can get and we can get them right on that edge given the information we have. But if we don't do our work in the headwater areas, that floodplain will grow over time or shrink or modify itself and thereby throw out all the good work we did to get everybody close to but not in uh, down the line. Um, <clears throat> so therefore we protect that new development, protecting the residents and, uh, and, and the first responders from, from having to deal with a, a new issue with regards to a flood that is inevitably going to come. Um, we are accountable for those decisions, as I've already indicated, and um, we continue to protect watercourses all down the watershed uh, for the very same reasons of, of if you alter a water uh, course or shorten it, you lose flood storage, start having negative impacts. <clears throat> um, we also protect and regulate shoreline areas, not so much our, our focus here today, but uh, there is certainly a flood component along the shoreline of Lake Huron, as we've been unfortunately reminded of regularly in the, in the most recent uh, weather <laughs> situations. Um, and this is a template, our, our regulation is, and our approach on a watershed basis is a template for other jurisdictions. We had our watershed moment in 54, uh, so to speak, with, uh, with the Hurricane Hazel, and it brought about the, about the changes we have had. But when High River and other jurisdictions have, have seen their floods, they've often come and looked for, well, how do we do this right? And conservation authorities are typically known as the gold standard with regards to uh, natural hazard management, which is which is great and uh, is serving um, the Southern Ontario communities very well. Um, and it is so key that we cross those political boundaries, of course, as has already been indicated. If only one municipality were to implement this and say they don't want any more flooding, um, they can do all they want really, but if their upstream community isn't on the same page, it doesn't help them. The Saugeen and other authorities in our regulation really uh, uh, tie those concerns and those uh, requirements together. <laughs> Next slide, please. <clears throat> so some statistics with regards to workload, you know, that there is certainly some concerns and, and some things we continue to work on in, in planning and regs at Saugeen around uh, time of review and, uh, and then some of the reports of, of some of our reviews in the community. Uh, so to get some information to, to the group, um, when I took over as the manager of environmental planning and regulations in 2013, <laughs> we had about 1,400 files per year uh, with already concerns around timelines of review at that time. Uh, as of 2019, anyway, we were up near 2,500 files a year, and we, you know we get the odd complaint still, and we want to address those. Um, but given our enforcement work and regulatory work, you know it is, is somewhat par for the course. But uh, we continue to do what we can to improve review times um, internally, and we're getting some provincial guidelines on that now as well that we'll be implementing in the near near term. And you see as well, uh, our permits also have, have went up over the years correspondingly with the total files, as you'd imagine. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and uh, since 2015, with regards to any of our letters to anybody asking us about their properties or a proposal, uh, we have asked and, and provided them an anonymous customer satisfaction survey. Uh, the percentages you see in front of us, my, my chart layout here could have been better. I haven't gotten a great layout for it yet, but anyway, the percentages you see in front of us is positive responses uh, to the questions asked, such as, uh, was review done quick enough? Was the decision clear? Was it the decision I am happy with? Um, that's all one to five, basically, was the questions along those lines. And you see the, the high, high um, positive response rate, somewhat to our own surprise, <laughs> given uh, someone, some of the things we all have been hearing from the community. Uh, the last question is to do with our appeal process. And it wasn't too good at the start with uh, awareness from the applicants. And we've been slowly improving that, as you see over the years. Um, but without further ado, that was the regulatory side completed. Um, thank you very much for listening and, and uh, maybe going over some ground you're already aware of, some of those in the room. Um, but uh, at this time, I, I may pass over to Brandy unless Sean was interested to jump back to uh, Joanne. Yeah, no, that's right. We'll just continue on to uh, Brandy, our environmental planning coordinator, who's going to tell us about 
land use planning for natural hazards. Uh, thank you, Sean. Um, uh, as Sean mentioned, my name is Brandy Walter. I'm the environmental planning coordinator here at uh, Saugeen. And uh, today I'd like to go over, you know, why the heck is Saugeen Conservation Authority and how, and um, how are we involved in land use planning? Uh, and it's specific to natural hazards. Um, next slide, thanks. So the content of my presentation today, I. As mentioned, I'd like to go over how and why is SVCA involved in land use planning? You know, what are natural hazards specifically defined in the uh, provincial policy statement? Um, a review of provincial natural hazard policies. Um, and something that I like to talk about is establishing principle of development through the Planning Act. Um, SVCA's uh, Planning Act review process and just a brief uh, comment on SBCA as planning partners. Next slide. So a Saugeen Conservation Authority, as well as all uh, conservation authorities across Southern Ontario are involved in land use planning under the Planning Act in five ways. Um, specifically, we act as an agency with a provincially delegated responsibility for um, natural hazard policies of the provincial policy statement. And moving forward, I'll refer to the provincial policy statement as PPS. We also act as uh, municipal technical advisors, as a public body under various regulations. This uh, has changed a little bit since uh, yesterday. So more to come on that, I suppose. Um, as a watershed-based resource management agency and as landowners, like all other landowners in our watershed. I'm going to just, um, for, uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to review the first two components because that's more specific to the natural hazard uh, planning process. Next slide. So all conservation authorities have been delegated responsibility uh, under the provincial one window planning system for natural hazard management. So as outlined in a memorandum of understanding between Conservation Ontario, MNRF, MMAH, um, conservation authorities have been delegated, uh, been delegated the responsibility from MNRF to represent the provincial interests regarding natural hazards uh, encompassed by section 3.1 of the PPS. So these delegated responsibilities require SVCA to review and provide comments on municipal policy documents such as official plans, comprehensive zoning bylaws, and also development applications. Uh, our purpose, all conservation authorities' purpose is, is to ensure that, you know, municipal policy documents uh, and development applications are uh, consistent with the natural hazard policies of the PPS. Next slide. The, this delegated uh, responsibility is typically included in local SVCA municipal planning review agreements. Uh, the natural hazard policies of the PPS are, uh, do closely parallel our regulatory requirements under the Conservation Authorities Act with the same hazard features and similar management and avoidance policies. So therefore, it really does make sense for SVCA to be the one agency to review these items at the planning stage, which avoids duplication also and helps ensure the opportunity for compliance at the SVCA permitting stage. Notably, uh, the Planning Act and the Conservation Authorities Act are both separate pieces of legislation and the decisions made under one or the other obviously do not override the other. Both must be uh, addressed independently. Next slide. We also um, act as technical advisors to our uh, planning partners and this is uh, provided, uh, this technical advisory role is provided to our municipalities as negotiated under the terms of planning service agreements. These plan planning service agreements guide our participation in the planning process. So including scope of review, details of review, timelines, fees, et cetera. Uh, regarding um, scope of review, uh, these agreements include matters related to policy uh, input and advice, environmental impacts, watershed science, technical expertise associated with both natural hazard and heritage management. 
Uh, currently, SBCA has a number of agreements with our member municipalities. These agreements are currently uh, being updated with a target date of 2021 for all of our agreements to be updated and finalized. Uh, next slide. Uh, what are natural hazards um, as defined under the uh, provincial policy statement? Um, natural hazards not only include flooding hazards, um, but they do include flooding hazards, erosion hazards, dynamic beach hazards associated with the, you know, the Great Lakes uh, shorelines and large in-lake systems. Uh, flooding hazards and erosion hazards um, also associated with lakes and stream valleys and also we have this um, definition for hazardous sites, and that includes your unstable bedrock, organic soils, and lead clays. Around here, we see mostly organic soils associated with our wetland areas. Uh, next slide. So under the um, section one uh, of the provincial policy statement, um, it is, it, there's a goal stated in there that that it's Ontario's for Ontario's long-term uh, prosperity, environmental health, and social well-being. Um, this all depends on reducing the potential for public cost or risk to Ontarians uh, from natural or human-made hazards. So to accomplish this goal, the uh, the principle of development is established through the PPS. Um, the natural hazard policies of the PPS are designated to direct development away from the hazard. Uh, where there is an unacceptable risk to um, public health and safety or property damage and, and to not create new hazards or aggravate existing hazards. Next slide. So this principle of development, uh, it ideally it's established first through the Planning Act approval process. Uh, the first step in natural hazard planning is, is, is to locate development safely away from the hazard lands in accordance with the PPS policies and, and the, the provincial mandate for public safety. Uh, this is a separate process from CA Act permitting, which provides for the technical implementation of matters pursuant to the Conservation Authorities Act, with the end goal of protecting both the natural feature and public safety. However, SVCA must ensure that our concerns related to the establishment of the pri pri uh, principle of development are conveyed to the planning approval authority during the preparation of municipal planning documents. So official plans, zoning bylaws, official plan amendments, and also during uh, the planning act approvals process. And the principle of development is not established firstly through the section 28 permitting process. Next slide. Just a quick flow of, um, you know, what happens when a uh, planning application comes to the Conservation Authority? Um, firstly, uh, there should be a consultation, pre-consultation process. Ideally, uh, the Conservation Authority is meeting with the municipality and the planning, um, the applicants. Uh, at this time, at this stage, it, it's it's better for the applicant to uh, apprise them of, of all the information they need to submit a complete application. After that, the uh, applicant will submit their application to the uh, municipality and uh, with their supporting information, it's then forwarded on to SBCA for uh, a review. Uh, and at this stage, we, we look at the application to determine, does it meet the, the policies as outlined it, in the PPS natural hazard policies. Um, we may, if all the information's there, we will make our recommendation. If it's not, then we make a request to the uh, approval authority for more information. Once that's all tied up, we provide recommendations to the approval authority and that's either through a report, uh, that's generally through a report, and um, after which the approval authority will make their decision. If a conservation authority permit is, is required, then the applicant will then seek to, to get their permit from SVCA. After which, once all approvals are in place, the project commences. Next. Through, so through this delegated and legislated Planning Act process, SVCA has become an invaluable participant in land use planning around natural hazards. So 
with current weather patterns, it, it's really become more evident that planning for safe development is critical. And so therefore, it is SBCA's goal to work cooperatively with our planning partners to plan for development that would be safe and not impacted by natural hazards. And I look forward to working with our municipalities uh, at every chance I get. And uh, thank you, that ties up my presentation. Okay, okay, I'm back. Uh, we're gonna throw things back to Joanne Harbinson. Uh, Britt, I think it was slide 42. Yeah, that looks about it. Uh, one more back. That's good. And uh, thanks for having me. Join the meeting. Thanks for having me back. And can't do much about rural internet, at least not yet. Hopefully those changes will come for improvement. So yeah, I was um, getting into the flood control structures here and starting at our upper end of the watershed with the ones that we have in the, the higher risk areas and talking about the Huron Dam. So just to continue with work here at the information on the upper Huron Dam in uh, the town of Dark Huron, that's great. Um, just to say that you can see how the configuration is set here um, in the lower two bays, the south bays on the bottom right side where there are uprights and flashboards in place to allow um, and timbers in the north two bays to encourage the freeze up um, of the reservoir ice and with the main flows being pushed towards the north bay. And so as Sean had explained earlier, the changing temperatures are closely monitored over the winter season and typically January thaw is critical to know the ice upstream level, how it will change. And to determine come February when the boards and timbers are to be removed prior to spring thaw. In the winter, a snow dam is also established by the municipality in the lower parking lot um, beside the dam as a safeguard to ensure that water that comes over the dam, dam embankment should it happen um, turns back to the main thaw unit. Next slide, please. The timing is critical for this dam. Boards are needed in the dam to mitigate flooding related to fragile life. However, the boards need to be removed before the spring melt and freshet. So the full capacity of the dam opening is available for the higher flows. We need to avoid unwanted pressures on the dam structure as well. Knowing when a, when a melt is coming and feeling confident that the threat of fragile ice production has passed, SBCA staff begin to chop away at the uprights by hand. Then a hydro is also brought in to um, remove the timbers in the north base, which then drops the reservoir level as it flows through the north and downstream, making it more conducive to remove the upright flash boards in the south base. With the dam now open, it will have full capacity to convey spring runoff flows. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the middle dam is owned by the Military Natural Resources at this time in forestry. However, the SBCA maintains and operates the structure. FECA operates the structure for recreational purposes in the summertime. The electric gate that is located in the center part of this dam, it allows staff to open uh, and close the gate as needed for increase or decrease in their flows and to ensure that the integrity of the structure and this dam uh, is maintained. The dam is not used for ice or flood control purposes. Next slide. The lower dam is again at a historic mill site, the co-op mill. The mill, the dam is used uh, as part of the fragile ice flood protection with a specific number of flashboards put in the dam in the fall to force the water towards the east bay. Similar to the upper dam, dam uh, putting in the boards allows an ice cover on the reservoir to, produce, to reduce production of fragile ice between this dam and the middle dam and to allow the fragile to move downstream. Various works have been completed at this dam to maintain its integrity and performance of the structure over the years. The Durham uh, downstream of the lower dam is the ice management channel. This work was done as a result in the recommendation of the Hatch uh, 2006 report to improve flow characteristics through the river channel so as not to stop or slow down the movement of fried life. This area also serves as an access road for heavy equipment that allows uh, the high hose to access the channel when it becomes uh, choked with fragile light. 
so as to alleviate potential for flooding in the town area. Annual maintenance is also done in this section of channel to ensure obstruction of flow by the removal of gravels uh, at a certain point through the, the section. Durham Creek, which is a creek that starts in the south um, of the upper dam flows and flows through town to the lower section of the river, can also have its outflow impacted during a flood event in high water of the Saugeen. Town staff operate a separate bypass pump uh, for this to ensure that the creek water can leave the residential area without causing a flooding problem. Next slide. As a result of flooding in the former village of Newstead, the implement, implementation of a flood control project was recommended uh, for, for the village, which resulted in moving the new creek westerly from behind the residential buildings that are along the county road 10 to be reconfigured in a channel, a new channel within the municipal road allowance. And this is located in the Lions Park there. So the new state creek, which flows through town uh, from the south to the north, was channelized in line with Gabion Basket to improve flow. Uh, in New Creek itself, upstream of the Queen Street Bridge, uh, it, it was also aligned with Gabion Basket and Goldie Maddie. Overall, 560 Gabion Baskets were used in this project. Next slide. In the early 1990s, SBCA completed work at the Newstead Dam to establish a flood wall. The intent of the flood wall is to keep the waters from New Creek above the dam in the reservoir and in the channel and not be allowed to flow down the, mill, the main street or mill street. This has happened previously. The gap you see in the bottom right corner of the, the screen is an active form of flood protection. West Gray Fire Department will be able to install two by four slats down this gap to prevent flood waters from escaping the channel. Next slide. Maintenance in Newstead is related to the loss of Fabian Basket's integrity and broken wires. Can you move the next slide, please, Bert? An increasing sediment in the channel. Unfortunately, Fabian wires deteriorate and corrode in contrast with water, in contact with water, and coating of the galvanized wire is removed by abrasion from sand and stone. Here is a drop weir structure that was part of the new channel construction that has, was repaired this fall when the bottom row of Gabion baskets lost confidence, confidence in and staff and staff continue to monitor through this structure as well as all the other baskets in Newstead, but realizing that some major work will never be, re be required. Next slide. <clears throat> in the 1950s in Walkerton, um, the S Walkerton and the SVCA started building dikes to address the annual flooding situation. The dike system is 2.4 kilometers long, protecting uh, 100 buildings, and it starts more or less at the uh, fire hall in the south, southern part of this map, and then goes towards the, uh, <clears throat> the Tim Hortons crossing into the old railway bed in the north section of the, of the river turn, and then over to the sewage plant. <clears throat> So this uh, protects uh, at least 100 buildings and that cover the majority of the downtown area businesses and homes. The dikes in Walkerton are constructed to the 100-year flood limit. Um, the dikes are intended to protect development on the south side of the river and do not provide any flood protection on the north side. Dikes are also located on the east side of the river, where the old school, school and bobbin uh, was, and which are now have the condominium, and then just downstream of the Truax Dam, the former Truax Dam. And as described by Sean, the SBC staff, SBCA staff monitor the flow through town and have an excellent understanding of the capacity of the channel and the dike system. Next slide. Because the dikes prevent flow from the land to the river, specific stormwater outlet structures provide controlled outflow to the river. They consist of a cement uh, head, head wall corrugated steel pipes and a steel flat gate on the end of the outfall. This prevents water from the flowing back into town from the river. However, ponding water uh, does occur on the land side of the dike when the outflows are blocked in the high river waters uh, during the event. Some of the more major drainage channels are cleaned out as needed to maintain positive flow uh, out to the river. The, the picture on the, the right hand side shows the uh, outflow from near the the uh, fireplace. 
Next slide. Inspecting flat gates at the stormwater outflows and managing woody growth on the dikes is an ongoing job. We have in the past applied for water erosion control infrastructure funding through the MNRF, which is available for projects um, that are owned by the supply uh, conservation authorities for major works. Remove the trees, but that was unsuccessful, but we continue to, to manage the project. Next slide. Another part of Walkerton's flood control, uh, flood protection is a flood block where Silver Creek joins the Sogdon River. The top picture shows the dikes along the south side of the river. Flooding along Silver Creek can be exacerbated when, when high flows are in the Sogdon River. However, in most cases, the peak on the Silver Creek will likely be passed before the Sogdon River peak, thus reducing the problem in the Silver Creek watershed. Next slide. Work in Walkerton has included rehabilitating the dikes near the ball diamond, bringing the dikes near the condominium up to the 100 year level, and the repair of two stormwater outfall, outflows. The pictures above show the work to replace an out, outfall structure at the end of Queen Street because the Gadian basket headwall has, was blocking the flat gate and the outfall of uh, John Waters. Next slide. In this example, this work was done uh, more, more recently where the bottom of the corrugated steel pipe in this outflow had eroded and concerns with the integrity of the dike be became evident between the land sides of the, uh, the dike of the catch basin and the river. Next slide. Final construction of either of these two projects needs to ensure that the dike repairs provide similar or better effectiveness to flood protection as they did before the work that was done in terms of restored height of the dike to ensure it's back to that 100 year level and that the clay core is maintained to reduce the uh, piping or water flow to the dike. Next slide. In, in Brockton, we also have the Pinkerton Dike. This project was completed in the 1960s and consists of 36 meter long dike sections to protect uh, flooding on the west side of the Pew Water. There is a culvert in this site that does allow a creek to outflow to the river. Now we're going to move on to uh, walk uh, through Paisley as we move downstream and in the municipality of Aaron Eldersley. And after yearly impacts of social and social disruption from flooding caused by the fact that 75% of Paisley was in the floodplain of the three rivers, the Saugeen, the Pew Water River, and the Willow Creek, Three kilometers of flood control dikes were constructed in the former village of Paisley to protect residents of the town at a cost point of 3.34 million. So Willow Creek was also provided with uh, flood control dikes. And you can see that kind of in, in the center part there, below the word Paisley. And then to the north of the Paisley is where the former channel was that was relocated as part of that. Next slide. The dikes were built to the elevation of the regional swarm in Paisley. In the two pictures on the right, you can see the same view of the church and the White House that was removed. In the bottom picture, you can see the dike in place in the bottom right and the bottom left. It's been known back that uh, Vicki MacArthur was known to live in the house, in that White House. With to the second one to the right of the um, church. And it was removed at the end of Church Street, uh, a notorious bank robber and the only person who had escaped walking in jail. Next slide, please. Here is a portion of the drawings that, are, that were used in terms of design work and engineering work for um, the project for the dike. This is phase one of the dike along the Peacewater River. In addition, you'll also see the detail on the bottom right of a section of the dike that shows the clay key in the base of the dike. This is the added protection that the dike provides with a clay core in the dike, as well as it being keyed in at about a meter and a half below the base of the dike into the ground. The dikes were built in Paisley in uh, three phases. Next slide, please. And this is just a view of the um, the Teeswater River Dyke, looking towards the County Road Bridge, County Road Three Bridge, looking east. 
Next slide. It should be noted that part as part of the flood control in Paisley, there are concrete panels in the north section of the bridge as the bridge slopes from down the direction from the south to the north. And this fills a gap in the painting of overall flood protection. Next slide. This next slide just shows the main saw in here looking back towards the county road tree as well as the arena. Next slide. As part of maintenance work, field staff, operation staff monitor the outflow channels, flat gates, and cut the grass as needed to inhibit the growth of trees and shrubs that could impact on the site's integrity and compromise its effectiveness. Next slide. This is the outflow channel from the former Willow Creek in the top left, and from the stormwater collection area behind the dike in the bottom left. During major runoff events and when the soggy river levels are high, SVCA field operations need to operate the pump. You can see the structure on the top of the dike here on the right. Um, to operate the pump, to move water from the land side to prevent residential flooding from surface water collection behind the dike. So that's an ongoing issue that is needs to be addressed during any time that we have a significant flood event. Next slide. Operation staff also ensure that the drainage systems on the land side of the dike and the flat gate on the river side are functioning and not blocked. And in particular, after our flow events, to make sure that twigs and other debris don't get lodged in. Next slide. So this is the, uh, the last flood control structure that I'll we'll show you here that's in our watershed. Um, in the last project um, for flood control that we've done, uh, in the Inverture and Flight Control Project, which comprised, was completed to reduce the flooding of cottages and residents below the block, it was recommended as part of a report from the former Key Harden Township completed in the 1980s, but which also included two other areas being Whippoorwill and Cedar Terrace areas. And this was the only, um, the only project that was actually implemented. implemented. And on the map, you can see um, in the uh, area where there's uh, the detention bond is located in the center to the right. And then as there's a channel that it outlets to and heads towards the lake um, through um, the cottages into a very tight. Let me show you some pictures on that. Next slide. So this project includes a detention pond with a five meter berm surrounding it and a controlled outlet or spilling pipe that leads to an open channel then flows about a kilometer to the Lake Huron. And you can see on the drawing, again, the height of the berm, the filling pond, which is on the, the drawing, as well as uh, matching down below in the, in the picture in the bottom left. And that kind of comprises of that. It's located on private land, which we do have an easement uh, to enter, cut the grass, and maintain the structure. Next slide. And this is another uh, shot showing to the north side of that burn from the filling pond. And the bottom right is the pipe inlet um, that goes from the open channel to Lake Huron. We'll be looking at the open, the open pipe of uh, doing a closed confined spaces uh, due to the fact that we feel there may be some issues with the corrugated steel pipe, corrugated steel pipe and corrosion, which did happen in the upstream in the, the filling pond area as well. Next slide. Ongoing issues, uh, as uh, both Brandy and Eric have talked about, and Sean, with high water in Lake Huron, have uh, and the blockage of our outlet pipe by rock, coppice, and debris that would prevent the outflow of water to Lake Huron is a problem for the Interjuron flood control project as the Lake Huron waters are high. As many of us uh, of our shoreline municipalities have experienced. This is monitored regularly by staff and municipal staff uh, to ensure a positive outflow is maintained. Next slide. This is the, this is the last slide to, see, to show that one of the structures that we uh, own and maintain in the property is a conservation area where a dam removal uh, has occurred. And you see from the before to the right, to the after on the right, uh, how the removal of a dam would can return it back to its natural system. Thank you. Thanks, Joanne. <clears throat> so at this time, we are 
going to, well, I'll just mention that we will be on the line until 12 o'clock or until everybody signs off, essentially. Um, we will open it up for questions either via chat or uh, audio or audio and video, if you're comfortable with that. Um, just prior to that, uh, we'll have some closing remarks here from our general manager. And then if you are interested in staying on the line and having a discussion, then feel free to do that. So at this point, I'm going to talk, toss things over to um, Jennifer Stevens for some closing remarks. Thank you, Sean. I would like to thank everyone for taking the time to participate in today's webinar. I hope that you have found the information conveyed helpful to you. It is Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority's intent to be an extension of each of our municipalities. We are here to support each, each municipality in its efforts to protect its residents, as well as property within its jurisdiction. As mentioned earlier by both Eric and Brandy, there have been some recent changes to the Conservation Authorities Act. Under Ontario, Ontario's Budget Measures Bill, Bill 229, uh, which was passed yesterday with Schedule 6, which amends the Conservation Authorities Act, was intact. Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority, together with all other conservation authorities across the province, will need to oper operationalize the province's amendments through enabling regulations. We are hopeful that these enabling regulations will be released soon and will include a period of public consultation. Once the regulations are finalized, policies and procedures will need to be established at Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority, which we intend to do in partnership with our stakeholders. I would like to recognize the tremendous efforts of SVCA staff in preparing for today's sessions. These efforts are appreciated. Before I wrap up today's session, I want to reiterate our continued desire for dialogue with our municipal partners. We are committed to supporting you in your day-to-day -day work and would be pleased to be part of your team. Please accept the best wishes of Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority, its staff, and our board of directors for a healthy and happy holiday season. Thank you. Thanks, Jen. So that wraps up the formal part of today's session. Um, if you have somewhere to be, feel free to, uh, to sign off at this point. If you have any direct questions, you could, uh, again, put them in the chat box below and uh, we'll go through those and, and do our best to answer them. Um, otherwise, you could use the uh, raise hand function. If you open up your participants list, there's a button there for raise hand. Um, and we will kind of facilitate that process. So I'll just wait to see if we have anything here. I'll give it another 20 seconds here. Okay, uh, I'm not seeing any questions in the uh, chat box and I'm not seeing any um, blue hands coming up here in the participants list. Again, if you do have any questions that maybe uh, you'd wanna reach out to us, uh, feel free uh, either via email or all of our cell phones are currently posted on the website as well. So definitely get in touch with us. Uh, we'll stay on the line here for a little longer, but we'll, we'll close down the presentation portion of uh, today's session. And again, I just wanted to thank everybody for taking some time out of their day to, uh, to join us and uh, hear a little bit about what Saugeen does. Thanks again.